topic of sin. I've entitled the message, That Sneaky Sin. Mankind has had trouble with sin ever since Adam, of course. And I'm calling this sneaky because it sneaks up on you. How many of you know that sin is sneaky? Yep. It is subtle. It is shy. Sly. It is cunning. It is crafty. It is clever. It is scheming. It is devious. It is tricky. It is conniving. It is deceitful. It is dishonest. It is underhanded. It is untrustworthy. It is secretive. It is slinking. It is hidden. It is conspiratorial and is black among many descriptions. I cannot emphasize enough tonight the sneakiness of sin. Number one, scriptures on sin. That's what we're going to do first. We're going to look at some Old Testament words for sin. That's on the screen, I think. Is it on the screen? You tell me when it's on the screen. Okay. The first word we want to look at is the Hebrew word ra. And it is translated wicked in Genesis 38, 7. And in that particular story, Judah's firstborn by the name of Ur, E-R, sinned. And we do not know what kind of sin it was, but it was so bad that God slew him. I wonder what that was, but I don't think we need to know. Something unusual about this is the word Ra is a reversal of Ur's name. Ur, E-R, and then R-A is like a reversal in the Hebrew. I'm not sure if that's pertinent or not. The second one that we find, it is Rasha. That's the second word up there. And it was translated wrong in Exodus 2.13. And you know the story of Moses when he was very young and goes out and watches the Hebrew slaves and two of them get in a fight. And you know what Moses does eventually. He slays an Egyptian. But he asked those men that were fighting, why do they wrong one another? So the word is translated as wrong. So we know that sin is wrong as well as wicked. And then there is another word. It is asham. It sounds like a shame. And it means and is translated offend in Hosea 4.15. And in Hosea, most of you know the story of Hosea and Gomer. And the adulterous Gomer was a picture of the adultery of Israel. And so we see now this offend is a word that characterizes sin, adultery of Israel. And then it is kata, C-H-A-T-A, sin, which we recognize very readily. In Exodus 20, 20, as the people stood before the smoking and quaking Mount Sinai, they were afraid. And uh, the, Moses said, you just move out of the way and don't sin against the Lord. And so they were to stay away from that mountain and not sin against the Lord. It is Avon, not what you buy from the ladies' makeup dealer. It is translated iniquity in 1 Samuel 3, 13. And if you know anything about 1 Samuel, that's Eli's sons. And they came to offer the sacrifices and they reached into those pots and got the food for themselves, the best food for themselves. And of course, they were committing adultery with the women of Israel right at the place of worship. And so that word Avon is translated iniquity in that case. And then that word is shagag, and it is translated erred, as in Isaiah 28, 7, it says the prophets were erring and the priests were at erring, and so were the people. No, the prophet, priest, and the people were erring. 
How were they airing in that passage of scripture? Strong drink. Strong drink is the way they were airing. Yes. And so then we have another word, ta, means to go astray. In Ezekiel 48, 11, and the Levites and the people were going astray. Not just the people, but the Levites who were the ones that take care of the tabernacle and the temple and so on. They had gone astray. And then it is Pesha, transgressed, as in 1 Kings 8, 50, Solomon's prayer for the people. Solomon had a long prayer in 1 Kings 8. And uh, that was a very long chapter and a very long prayer. But he prayed for the people that they would not transgress and that they would not rebel against God. So the word there is transgressed. Layman Strauss says this about those Old Testament words. The great Greek scholar. He says the usage of these words leads to certain conclusions about the doctrine of sin in the Old Testament. Number one, sin was conceived of as being fundamentally disobedience to God. Get that one in your heart. It's fundamentally, it means disobedience to God. You say, well, I know that. Number two, while disobedience involved both positive and negative ideas, the emphasis was definitely on the positive commission of wrong and not the negative omission of good. Of good. In other words, sin was not simply, now remember this one, sin was not simply missing the mark, it was hitting the wrong mark, shooting at the wrong mark totally, not just missing the mark, but hitting the wrong mark. So number three says sin may take many forms as we've already studied through those Old Testament words. And the Israelites were aware of all the forms that sin would take. And I think it behooves us to be aware of the many forms of sin. It's not just one thing. It's many things. Now let's look at the New Testament. So the first thought I have tonight is the scriptures for sin in the Bible. So in the New Testament, we have some words as well for sin. Many, many words. First of all, we have kakos. It is translated evil. In Romans 13, 3, and it talks about in Romans 13, 3, about the rulers are a terror, not to the good, but to the evil. And it's translated evil in that case, kakos. And then it is poneros, and it is evil, uh, translated evil again, but it's like in someone that is guilty in Matthew 5, 45, where God says that he causes the sun to rise and to set on the good as well as the bad or evil. So it's translated evil in that case. It is asebus, ungodliness, as in Romans 1.18, description of the unrighteous. It is inakos, danger, as in Matthew 5.21, where it talks about the murderer and judgment. It is harmartia, which one we hear quite a bit. That's the one we hear mostly. Sin, as in 1 Corinthians 6.18, Warning against fornication in 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Well, that passage will come up several times, but it's a warning against fornication, and it is translated as unrighteous or unrighteousness. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, we have the warning about fornication and uh, idolaters and adulterers and effeminate and abusers, and it lists a whole lot of things there for that word, adakia, for the unrighteous. And then we have another group of words, another screen here. It is anomos, lawless, as in 1 Timothy 1, 9. The purpose of the law was for the lawless, not for the obedient, but for the disobedient. So that's the purpose of the law. It was for the ungodly, for the unholy, for the profane, for the murderers of parents, for the murderers of mankind, it says in that passage of Scripture. So it was lawless or lawlessness. It is parabates. It is translated transgression, as in Romans 5:14. It's describing Adam's sin. It is a agnonin. It means ignorant, as in Romans 1:13, where it talks about those who were ignorant. And then Paul is really talking about this, talking to the saints. And he's, as he writes to the saints at Rome, he said, "I don't want you to be ignorant." Now he's talking about 
He didn't want them to be a sinner or like a sinner. Agnoing, agnoing is the word. I guess we get the word agnostic from that word. And then it is plainan, deceived, as in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, a warning against fornication, idolatry, adultery, effeminates, and uh, uh, abusive of mankind. It is peroptomai, fault, as in Galatians 6, 1. If a brother be overtaken with a fault, Restore such a one, it says in Galatians 6, 1. Those are a lot of words, fault. And then here's another one. It is Hippocrates. Uh, hypocrites, I guess, is a better word. Hi hypocrites, or the uh, Greek word is hypocrites. It's hypocrisy, translated hypocrisy, as in 1 Timothy 4, 2. Speaking lies and having a seared conscience. Now, here's a lot of words. From the Old Testament and the New Testament, a whole lot of words, and every one of them a little bit different. Again, Layman Strauss says the reason for these words, we can draw several conclusions. Number one, there's always a clear standard against which God, against which sin is committed. So there's always a standard against which sin is committed. Number two, ultimately all sin is positive rebellion against God and a transgression of his standards. Number three, evil may assume a variety of forms. Same thing we studied in the Old Testament form. And then number four, man's responsibility is definite and clearly understood. So clearly we are to understand from all these words what sin is. Makes me think about it a little bit more when I think about those words. I don't know if you've ever looked at those words and tried to understand about them. But I think tonight would be a good time to look at all those words and maybe think, now where would that find me? Where would I be in that list? And um, so I'm saying that, of course, the Bible says all men are sinners. But I think that the doctrine of sin is the important doctrine. Is the doctrine of sin an important doctrine? Does anybody think the doctrine of sin is an important doctrine? You know, I look back to see how many times I had actually preached on the doctrine of sin. Do you know, even though I preach about sin, I have not taken very little time to talk about the specific doctrine of sin. I was a little bit disappointed in myself. I hadn't preached that much on the doctrine of sin. You say, well, preacher... We're all saved and ready to go to heaven and trying to live the best we can. Why do we need to think about the doctrine of sin? Well, can I give you my title again? S that sneaky sin. That sneaky sin. Even people who are living for the Lord and trying to do the best they can, sin sneaks up on them. Amen. We better beware. Is that right? So now I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the sneakiness of sin. I talked about the scriptures and sin. Now I want to talk about the sneakiness of sin. The first step of sneaky sin is that lust conceives. If you will, turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And let's read our Bibles tonight. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 27. James chapter 1, 12 through 27. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Of course, my object of tonight's message is that you would be that blessed man, that you would not succumb to temptation. That's the object. That's the purpose. That's the goal. And I don't know, but any of you probably would like to get the crown of life. How many of you would like a crown? Yes. Yes. So I think probably verse 12 gives us the motive for studying this doctrine of sin and uh, we need to be blessed or happy 
and endure temptation and then receive that crown of life. And then it says in verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But, as, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. There's a good word for sin at deceiving your own self. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. There's that word blessed again. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth, there that deceive again, his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Well, that's a good passage, but here's the thought I want to bring out of that passage. Lust conceives sin. Lust conceives sin. Adam Clark says this, that lust is an evil propensity. That means a tendency. So each of us has a lustful tendency. Each of us has that, a propensity. And he said that evil propensity working unchecked. And so here's the thought of this lust when it conceives bringeth forth sin that just a little lust goes unchecked and unchecked and unchecked and then there is sin so this my title is sin that sneaky sin here it is that little tendency to sin just a little tendency to sin comes about and lust conceives and brings forth sin and then it's unchecked and it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps growing. Just a little tendency allowed to grow is all that it takes for sin to happen. Just one drink, just one smoke, just one click, just one tap, just one look, just one item stolen. It only takes one for lust to become sin. I know every generation has its heroes and preachers and evangelists and missionaries. There was a generation that had the heroes like Jim Elliott. There was a generation that had heroes like William Carey. There was a generation that had uh, heroes like Bob Jones Sr. And there was uh, heroes that, of other generations, but and even some even closer to our generation now. But one I remember that was a hero in my dad's generation, in Dr. Seitler's generation, a man that I remember when I was a little child was Fred Garland. Fred Garland was a convicted, convicted felon and sentenced to the infamous Tombs uh, prison in New York City. Sometime in the process of time, I'm not sure it's during prison time or before prison time, but somewhere in that time, Fred Garland had tuberculosis and he lost his left lung because the tuberculosis ate away his lung. 
But he was in prison at tombs for theft, grand larceny, and things like that. But when he was in prison, they would put him in different wards because of his tuberculosis. And then finally, he got sent to a sanatorium. But he was from Roanoke, Virginia, something I didn't know till I looked up his story. And he was a former, short time though, producer of programs and dramas and things like that in Broadway in New York. He worked for a company that did that, and he was a short-time producer on Broadway. But that didn't last long because he gambled, and he drank heavily, and he began to take dope. Friend would come up to him and say, you, it's in Royal Oak, you got to go with us to New York. And he said, no, I don't want to go there. And he said, well, why are you going to New York? He said, to get some heroin and to give you a high you've never had before. And things like that. So here is a gambler, a drope addict, a drunkard, a man with tuberculosis, stealing constantly to keep up his drug habit and his gambling habit. And he got involved with gangs in New York. And it's amazing that he lived through that. But while he was in prison, there was a small voice that would say, Fred, you need to go to that chapel. You need to go to that chapel. And every now and then he would go to that chapel. And finally, the preacher began to read some scripture in that chapel. And the grace of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit changed Fred. And he began to go back from and I would call this his conversion. I'm not sure if this is when he would point to the time of his conversion. But he left that chapel that day after hearing scriptures like come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And other verses, many other verses. But he went back to his room that day and he began to ask different ones in the prison to, to forgive him for different things. Finally, he was released from prison because he was given six months to live and the way that he got released from prison was because his uh, wife was a friend to a uh, wife of a DA and so on. And the district attorney came in and testified for him. And miraculously, he got out of prison with six months sentence. And then he was also given this diagnosis by the doctors. You've got six months to live. Well, finally back in Roanoke, Virginia, in his sister's house with tuberculosis stronger and stronger in his body, the doctors told him we need to take out 10 of your ribs on your left side. Tuberculosis had eaten up this lung, and they wanted to take out 10 of the ribs. So they went in and took out four. And they said, Let, wait a little while, and we'll take out some more. So they waited a little while, and they didn't get much better, and they went back in to take out the other six. They took out one more, and the doctors told uh, his sister, that's it. There's nothing we can do. We're not going to take out any more. So now he's got a lung that's eaten up by tuber tuberculosis. He's missing five ribs, and um, he's getting weaker and weaker all the time. But he begins to memorize Scripture and believing that God had something for him to do. He had a very slow recovery sitting on his sister's porch down in Roanoke, Virginia. And I remember Fred Garland now, he's older and he's an evangelist now. He walked with a limp because all this stuff was gone. And uh, he spoke loudly, real loud. You could hear him without a microphone for miles, it seemed like. He clapped his hands real loud so that it'd scare you to death when he clapped his hands. And I can remember as he would tell his story of how the Lord saved him out of that uh, prison and out of the tuberculosis wards and sanatoriums and from the doctor's diagnosis and the rest of it. I can hear him say this as clear as a bell. I can hear it in my mind. He would say, it only took one drink for me to become an alcoholic. One drink, he would say. One smoke, he would say. I can hear him today. I was amazed to see that he has a book for sale, and it's not, uh, he's not doing the selling, but somebody else is selling his book. Uh, it's called From Dope, Fiends, From Dope Fiends Sale to the Pulpit, and it's a rare book, and it's priced by some lady at $150.
His story is on Unshackled. If you want to go to unshackled.org and go to number 3321 and 3322, you'll hear the story that I just told you. He went to Winston-Salem and when he started, he said, I believe the Lord's called me to preach, to be an evangelist. He immediately thought, called to be an evangelist. And so he went to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and began to preach on the streets. And he preached from Romans chapter 8. And we preached on part of that passage on Sunday, the first three or four verses. But he preached on the last part, 35 and 39. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And souls began to get saved. Then he started having meetings. People heard about his meeting on the street, heard him preach, and had him come in. And that began the ministry of Fred Garland. How did I know him? Well, I knew that my daddy knew him and invited him to preach revivals at Faith Baptist in Lawrence. But I also knew his son and his daughter. Um, his daughter, his son's name was John Thomas, and he lives in Laurel, Maryland now, as far as I know. And then his daughter is uh, Mary Ann Garland, and she's married, and I think she lives down in Florida. So they had moved to Florida way back when. Those two young people were students at Tabernacle Christian School back in the late 60s. That's how I got to know them. But I still hear that loud clap and that, it took one drink! I can still hear that to this day. You say, what are you saying? Because Fred Garland said, one drink? It just takes little things. Just little things. When lust, that tendency... That tendency to sin, that little tendency, when it is unchecked, it just takes one, one thing to sin. There's a verse in the Song of Solomon that I often think of, and it says this, Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Now, I know that's about a great love story of Solomon and his bride, and I know it's also a type of Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. And I know it's a wonderful love story. And I know that foxes and the little foxes that spoil the vines has something to do with that. But I know one thing that I'd like to make an application for tonight. It just takes a little fox to spoil one good grapevine. It takes one fox, just a little bitty fox, to spoil an entire healthy producing grapevine. Just one little fox. And what's the application for you? It takes one little sin to ruin a perfectly healthy believer. One little sin will ruin a perfectly healthy believer. That little sin is not satisfied. It is like a honeysuckle vine. It grows and grows until it strangles its subject. Finally, the honeysuckle vine in mass now ruins a perfectly good metal fence and even brings it to the ground that can happen to any believer just a little fox just a little cons little pre pre tendency to sin just a little bit can make it happen so we have studied the scriptures of sin and we have studied the sneakiness of sin I want to last look at the salvation from sin. And that's screen number four, Harold. The Bible says in Romans 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God has a high and holy standard of what is right. And so long as man follows the divine standard, he will see himself as he truly exists in God's eyes. The flat statement of the Almighty is that all men have fallen far short of God's command of his required standard. It is the popular and common practice of men to create their own standards. However, God has established his perfect standard for entry into heaven. And all men, and a sin in this scripture means to miss the mark. And remember, it doesn't mean just miss the mark. It means to shoot at the wrong mark. Hit the wrong mark is what it means. So every single man has missed the the mark, every single one. Layman Strauss again says this, 
Let no man ever think that he comes anywhere near the standard set by God. God has demanded absolute perfection, and no matter how one measures himself, he falls far short. Often what I'm trying to witness, and I have a hard time sometimes explaining things like this, but as I try to explain it, I have sat on many a porch, and I sit there and a porch rail would be in front of me and I would say you know when it says for all of sin to come short of the glory of God I said you can jump six inches off this porch you might not make the top of the railing you might jump the foot and you might not hit the top of the railing I said and you might jump two foot and you might not hit the top of the railing the railings are usually around 30 and something like that and I said but if you jumped all the way to the very bottom of that railing would you be over it? And guess what every one of them would say? No, you got to get over it. And I said, man has missed the mark. He never can get over it. I have several people to bow their heads and accept Christ because they knew that there was nothing they could do to get over that mark except to by faith believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The divine verdict is in every instance is the same. You have come short, you have missed the mark. When the best of men have done their best, our Lord would challenge each with these words, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his statue, Matthew 6, 27. However much the difference that is lacking, no man by himself can raise himself to meet God's moral standard. For all have sinned. That's his moral standard. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes, all without exception, for says God, we have before proved both Jew and Gentile, they are all under sin. Romans 3, 9, that is both Jew and Gentile have missed the mark. So, the word has spoken. There is a set standard. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Next screen, not only has the word spoken, but the Holy Spirit has spoken. Holy Spirit says in John 16, 8, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Number six, up screen number six. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All these you know. But that's not all. Those are the, the Holy Spirit speaking. The Word has spoken. The Holy Spirit has spoken. But you must speak. Every individual must speak. 1 John 1, 9. This is a screen 7. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That is, in a nutshell, the doctrine of sin and God's salvation. So we have studied the scriptures for sin. We have studied the sneakiness of sin. And now we've talked about the salvation from sin. Aren't you glad you're saved? But do we still have that tendency to sin? We better watch it. It only takes just a little. Let that tendency go unchecked. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Let's pray.